been taking several seconds to connect. But now we're live on Instagram, so shout out to everybody on Instagram who's watching this on replay. Because right now, this just started. Nobody even saw that I was live yet. But now we then pinned our comment as y'all are coming in. You checking in on Facebook. Y'all know what to do. Leave a comment. Tell me your name and location. And or hit that share button so somebody else who is somebody else who's on your timeline will actually see that I'm live right now. Share the wealth and let somebody know what's going on right now. If you are checking in on Instagram right now, y'all know the drill. Tell me your name and location in the comments section. Congratulations to Adrian from Germany with the first comment. So as y'all come in, tell me your name and location in the comments section. We are getting started very shortly. Very shortly. It's already 5.20 p.m. We are getting started very shortly. As y'all come in, tell me name and location in the comments section. Hit that share button. Wherever you happen to be watching this from, you're watching it on Facebook, hit the share button. If you're on Instagram, I don't think they do share for lives. If they do have shares for live, then share it. But if they don't, leave a comment. Tell me your name and location. That's the best thing you could do. We getting started in less than 60 seconds. Whoever's here is here because y'all know what I say. To be early is to be on time. To be on time is to be late. To be late is to be forgotten. Andy91282 was good. Killian checking in from Romania. What's going on? Corey Billy checking from New Mexico. We got Akun checking in from Calgary, Canada. All right, if y'all here, hit that share button on Facebook, please. So somebody that you know, so on your timeline, will know that we live. If you want Instagram, hit the comment button and leave a comment and say, hey, who are you? Where? Are, what is your name and where are you checking in from? I just want to know who I'm talking to. We're going to get into today. You already know what the topic is. If you saw yesterday's live, then you know what the topic is for today's live. If you didn't see yesterday's live, that's all right. I mean, it's not all right, but it is all right. Man, you're going to get the second half of the what I was talking about yesterday, and I'll tell you where you can get the first half. It's going to take some time, but you can get the first half a different way. So as y'all come in, again, tell me your names and locations. We're going to get started in a moment. I'm going to introduce myself in one moment, and then we're going to get right into the material, and whoever has to come in late and catch the middle of it or catch a portion of it, they're just going to have to catch a portion of it because that's just what the game is, just how it goes. Uh, Mattia checking in from Croatia over on Facebook. So Facebook, hit that share button. Instagram, hit the comment button. Tell me your name and location. Now, for those of y'all don't know who I am, my name is Dre Baldwin, also known as Dre All Day, former nine-year professional basketball player, author of 25 books. Uh, presenter of four TED Talks. I'm a keynote speaker, coach, consultant, trainer, content producer, Uber content producer, Uber value dropper. I, what else did I do? I've published over 7,000 videos on YouTube, 7,000 articles. I have, I have a daily, daily masterclass that some of y'all will call a podcast. It is called Work On Your Game. It has over 1,400 episodes and that is daily. Every single day since this time in 2016, I put out a new masterclass every single day. I got known on YouTube by putting out videos every day. I write articles every day. Sometimes I might not send them every day, but I write every single day. I've created over 200 programs. As I told you about the TED Talks, I told you about the books, and I got a lot of other stuff going on that we don't need to talk about right now. This is not about the story of my life. What I'm talking about here today, as we get into part two of this, actually before I get to that, I want to tell you one more thing. I created this whole framework, this whole mentality, this whole mindset, this business, this brand that is called Work On Your Game. It's all about taking a pro athlete mindset and teaching how to apply that mindset to your business, to your sport, and to your life. How can you take the frameworks that I use to become successful playing sports and how you can apply that to your business life and to your life life? And everybody knows that life itself is a business as it is. It costs money to live, it costs money to die, and it costs money in between. So everything we do is a business. I wrote a book about that whole Work On Your Game philosophy, and this book right here is called as you can see, work on your game. Y'all can see the branding match right there. Pro athlete mindset to your business, sports, and life. This is not a sports book. This is not a sports philosophy. I just happen to have been an athlete, and that's why I use sports as a reference sometimes, but not all the time in what I do. I work with entrepreneurs, business professionals, athletes, and people trying to become athletes, people trying to get to the pro level in sports, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. What we're talking about here today is part two of two. If you did not see yesterday's live, I suggest when this is over, don't leave now, but I suggest when this is over, you go and check yesterday's live. You want to see it immediately, what you need to do is head over to Facebook, because on Facebook, all the lives, they just stay on my timeline. So Facebook slash work on your game, you can see all the lives that I've done this year, because I've been doing live every day this year, not all of them are on Facebook, all of them are on Instagram, but everything's going to be on YouTube eventually, because there's a timeline for YouTube, but with Facebook, my live from yesterday is still there. The topic is... The best advice that I ever got from coaches in my life. This is specifically from sports coaches. So there are 12 pieces of advice that I wanted to share with you all, the audience 
of what I learned from coaches as a as an athlete, an amateur athlete, and a professional athlete. Yesterday, I told you the first six. Today, I'm going to tell you numbers seven through 12. Best advice that I ever got from coaches. Maybe it wasn't advice they were trying to give me. It might have just been something that they did or something that they said that I took it and I was able to figure out, all right, what, is, what can I extract from this is actually useful that I can use for the rest of my life, rest of my career, first of all, then the rest of my life. And then how can I give it to an audience of people who might not even be basketball players, not even in my situation, might not even be athletes, but they can still get value from it. That is my skill. That's what I do best. I take an experience or some piece of information that I learn or heard or watched or something that somebody else went through. And I'm able to translate that and extract the value out of it and then tell other people who might not even be in that situation how you can gain from a situation that somebody else but me or anybody else went through. That's what I do best. And that's how I'm able to create uh, so many products, content, ideas, et cetera, et cetera. All that being said, let's get into the material since we already are 11 minutes into our time here. Number one, we're talking the best advice that I ever got from coaches in my life. So we're going to say number seven because I'm going number seven through 12. I did one through six yesterday. Number seven, this is my sophomore year of college. I'm going into my sophomore year of college. So my freshman year, I walked on and played at the school called Penn State Abington. That summer, I used to go up to the campus every day in the off season, and I would just practice by myself, just work on my game by myself in the gym. And this is in the summertime. So y'all, any of y'all been on a college campus in the summertime, you know it's much more quiet in the summer than it is during the year. And Penn State Abington was already a small campus. So in the summertime, there's nobody on campus. So I would come to the gym and work out by myself every day. Nobody else ever came in there. I had the whole gym, and this is a nice gym. Penn State Abington's gym is very nice, one of my favorite gyms of all time. I had the whole gym to myself, the weight room, the cardio room, and the basketball court all to myself all day, every day that summer. So one day, I didn't. I would eat breakfast at home, then I would drive up to the campus and work out. Because Penn State Abington does not have dorms. So you live at home, home, and you go to school. It's a commuter campus. But one day I didn't eat breakfast before I went to the gym. So I parked my car next to the gym like I always did. Walked over to the cafeteria to get something to eat. I happened to run into this coach randomly. He recruited me on the spot. Ended up going to Penn State Altoona. Now, I didn't, wasn't yet at Penn State Altoona. But that summer, after I had met this coach, about a week later, he was like, yo, you should come up to Altoona to visit the campus so you know you could take an official visit you can see what the campus is like we could talk a little bit more i can show you what we got going on here and you can really decide what you want to do now i'm gonna tell y'all side note i already knew what i wanted to do i already knew i was going to penn state altoona i didn't care what the campus looked like there was nothing that coach could have said or did that would have made me not come to penn state altoona i knew i wanted to go because i wanted to get the hell out of philadelphia i wanted to get out of going to penn state Abington. i wanted to have a real college life experience like living in the dorm or off campus and partying and all the stuff that you think happens in college well it does happen in college but you got to be on a campus to actually know that that's happening so Abington didn't have that experience Altoona had it so that summer I go up to visit me and my my father drove up there so we drive up to Altoona it's like four hours away from Philadelphia and he's the coach is there we go to his office he's showing us around the campus he's showing us the dorms he's telling us all kind of stories he tells us how to have march madness and how all the fans are and he told me about everybody else that was already on the roster he told me about the other players he was recruiting he walks me around shows me the gym shows me all this stuff and it's all great all right again like i said i already knew i was going there so i really didn't give a damn what he said because i was coming no matter what happened the worst only thing he could have done to keep me from coming was you no know, pull out a gun and, and murder me or my dad on a visit. Other than that, I was coming to Penn State Altoona. So at the end of the visit, this is the very last conversation we had. He took us, he had me and my dad follow him in his car down to the mall that's in town in Altoona. It was called Logan Valley Mall. I don't know what they call it now. That mall still even exists. But we get to the parking lot of the mall. He's like, yeah, this is the town. It's the center of town. It's the mall. A lot of the students, if they want to go shopping, they come down here. And he's just talking, talking. And finally, we're standing outside of our cars in the parking lot of the mall. And he's just giving his final remarks because me and my dad are about to get on the highway. And he's telling my dad, this is the way you got to go get, go here and here. And you can get back to Philadelphia on the road. And my dad's like, cool. So he's just making his final remarks. And the coach says to me, he says, Dre, look, last year, you know, I did some research on you since I found out who you were. And I found out from your coach. He said that even though you were probably the most skilled, most talented player on the team, Sometimes your performance was not at that level. Sometimes your performance was kind of average. You can't come here. You, and it, then he said this. He said, I'm not recruiting you to come here and be an average player. All right, this is the point that I'm giving you. This is number seven. Coach said, I'm not recruiting you to come be an average player. I'm recruiting you 
because I think you could be the best player on this team. I think you could be one of our top players on this roster next year, even though you just finished your freshman year, you're about to be a sophomore, you could probably be the leading scorer on this team. You're good enough to be that guy on this team, but I'm not recruiting you to be average. I'm recruiting you to come in here and do something. The point of this, point of this point number seven is this. When you have game, when you have skill, that is not the end of your work. That's the beginning of your work. See, having game, this whole philosophy that I talk about, work on your game. Once you do work on your game and you develop some game and you start to get recognized for your game and people know you for your game, you're starting to get paid for it. Maybe you're getting recruited for it. You're getting attention because you have game. Understand that that is not the finish line. That's the starting line. Because as soon as people, including yourself, recognize that you have game, now you know what, what comes with that. You know what comes with having game? You know what comes with that recognition? Responsibility. The responsibility is that, and along with responsibility, you got expectations. And with responsibility and expectations, somebody got to deliver. And when you have responsibility and expectations on your shoulders, even though you have game, it's not always so easy to deliver. Sometimes people collapse under that pressure. Sometimes people are not used to the responsibility and expectations. So even though they have game, they underperform and they underachieve because they're not used to having all the attention on them. They're used to being good. But they were good, like, by surprise. Nobody thought they would be good, and they come out of nowhere and do something. Everybody's like, wow, that was, that was nice what you did. You're pretty good at what you do. But it's a whole different ball game from when you're the nobody guy, you walk in the room, and people are like, damn, that was pretty good what you did. And then when you're the somebody guy, you walk in the room, and people are like, all right, we expect you to be great. It's a whole different game when they don't expect anything, and you do something good, and when they expect everything. And now you got to deliver. Now the whole room is watching you like, yeah, that's the guy, him right there. Yeah, he's the one who's supposed to be the best. And everybody's watching you. You can feel that energy. And when you have that on you, it's a, it's a different level of performance. It's a different level of mental game that you need to perform when you're at that level. So any of you out there right now who you're kind of a nobody at what you do, you're a nobody in your environment, okay, go ahead and perform. You still need to perform. Do your thing. Get your attention and all that. But understand, there's going to come a day when if you keep performing – you're not going to be a nobody anymore. You're going to be a somebody. And every time you walk in a room, everybody's expecting you to be great. A great comedian. I mean, think about this. If you are a comedian, for example, and you go to some open mic and you got some really funny jokes. People are going to be like, man, that no name comedian was pretty funny. He was actually pretty good. Somebody might ask you your name, follow you on Instagram, take a picture with you because you were surprisingly good. But imagine what it's like when Louis C.K. or Jerry Seinfeld or Dave Chappelle or Chris Rock walks into a comedy club. What do you think it's like for them? All right. Everybody in that comedy club is like, all right, we know this person's super famous. They made all this money. They got all this attention. They better be funny. They're expecting Dave Chappelle to be funny. They're expecting him to say something that they never heard before. They're expecting him to be really at a level of comic that you couldn't even imagine. They're expecting him to be great, and he's still got to deliver. That's completely different from when you're the nobody. Michael Jordan, for example. Y'all know the Michael Jordan doc is out right now. And I, went and I saw Michael Jordan play live one time. His last year, it was either his, no, his second to last year, when he was with the Washington Wizards, the Wizards played a preseason game against the 76ers. I'm from Philly, but they played a preseason game at Penn State. Now I went to school at Penn State Altoona. So at the main campus, Penn State, it was the Washington Wizards against the Philadelphia 76ers. Iverson was on the team, and of course, Jordan is there. And when Michael Jordan came on the court, it was crazy. I've never seen anything like this before. And I've never seen anything like this since for any basketball player. And I've seen LeBron play. I've seen all the name guys that's out now. I've seen them all play live. Every time Michael Jordan moved, every time he touched the ball, all you saw was all these flash bulbs go off of cameras. Now, this is before we had smartphones, y'all. So this is like Kodak cameras or whatever kind of cameras people had where the flash had to go off. Every time this dude touched the ball, all you saw was all these flashing lights go off. And it's not like they tell you you can't use a camera. It's not like they stop the game. Like, hey, there's too many flashes. Let's pause the game so everybody takes the picture. It's not like that. You, he had to play through that. Every single, every single time he moved, everybody was watching everything he did. And I'm sure he knew that. By this point, Michael Jordan's like the biggest thing in basketball. He had retired and come back. Can you imagine performing with that kind of scrutiny? With 20,000 people all expecting you to be the best out of everybody. Your opponents expect it. Your teammates expect it. Expect it. You expect it. That's a whole different level. It's a whole different ball game. And you need to be mentally prepared for that before it happens. All right, you don't want to show up and then realize, oh, man, everybody's expecting me to be amazing. I wasn't expecting. I was expecting to be a kind of a fly on the wall here. But now everybody's expecting me to be great. 
All right, that pressure, you can't touch it, you can't taste it, you can't see it, you can't write it down, but it's real and it does exist. Christy Dawn, what's going on? And I talk about how to handle that. Performance anxiety, being mentally prepared, in this book right here. I'll tell you how to get this later on. So that's number seven. Number eight, today's topic for those who came in, I'm giving you part two of two, the best advice I ever got from my basketball coaches. My, so that coach, he coaches me my sophomore year. The team was not very good that year. We lost uh, all our big men before the season. That was one of the problems. And we had some chemistry issues and all that. Different story, different day. The coach gets fired. The coach who recruited me for my sophomore year at Penn State Altoona gets fired. New coach comes in. The new coach, and this is what coaches do in college basketball or college sports period. When a new coach comes into a program, a lot of times you'll see the former, the players who are already on the team, a lot of players will transfer. A lot of, yeah, a lot of players just transfer because they're like, all right, this new coach wants to put their own stamp on the program. This is what college coaches do. They want to bring in their own players. They want to put in their own system. And a lot of the players that were already there, they push those players out because they want to bring in some other players, some different guys. And maybe the players just don't want to deal with that coach. And they weren't recruited by that coach. So they want to go play for somebody else. So this new coach comes in. I did not transfer. And I go and actually make the basketball team. Not everybody made it. We had like nine returning players. Only three of us made the team. And I made it. I played my way onto it in tryouts, did my thing. But the problem with this coach was he had pushed off a whole lot of the best bigs that we had on the team. So we had the same problem again the second year. The first year was injuries and people ineligible. This year with the bigs, he just cut some good big guys that we had on the team. So we didn't have any big men on the team. So the coach was trying to make me play like a big man position, like power forward, backup center. And it wasn't quite working because I'm not that big of a guy. I'm tall, but I'm not that tall. I'm only 6'4". But at D3, you could kind of play. There were 6'4 power forwards at the D3 level, but they were big dudes, like wrestlers, you no know, weightlifting type dudes. I'm an athletic guard type of body guy, but he's still, still trying to make me play power forward. It wasn't working. So, of course, I'm pushing back against what he wants me to do. He's telling me what he wants me to do. I'm telling him what I want to do. And there becomes this power struggle. Here's the problem with a power struggle when you're an athlete playing college sports is that you don't have any power. So it's not really a power struggle. It's like a power beatdown because what leverage you don't have any power. Now, it's one thing if LeBron James in the NBA says, hey, I don't like this coach. The coach is going to get fired because LeBron James has the power to get that coach out of there. But in college, you never hear a player say, hey, I want to get the coach fired or I don't like this coach. I want a new coach. You never see that happening in college sports. You know why? Because college players have no power. All right, college players don't have contracts. They don't get paid. The coaches get paid. So guess who has the power? The coach has the power. So anytime there's a power struggle between a player and a coach in college sports, the player always loses 100% of the time. The coach, coaches are undefeated when it comes to having a power struggle with one individual player on a college team. So I was one of these players that got in a power struggle with my coach, and it wasn't really a power struggle. It was a quick fight. I lost. I ended up kicked off the basketball program and didn't play my last year and a half of college basketball. Now, this was not advice that I got from my coach. That coach who kicked me off the team, he didn't give me any advice. But this is point number eight. Here's point number eight. You have to know when to shut up and when to speak up or when to speak up and when to shut up. When you need to yield to someone who has more power than you. Now, some of you, if you're anything like me, if you have ego, if you have pride, if you think your idea might be better than somebody else's idea and you might even think that you're right, you also still had to be smart enough to know, hey, uh, even if I think my idea is better than this person, even if I think I'm smarter than this person, if I express that, is that going to make things better or is it going to make things worse? Is this going to help the situation or is this going to hurt the situation? Is this going to put me in a better position or is this going to hurt my position? This is a question that you need to ask yourself before you open your mouth, before you say the wrong thing, before you do the wrong thing. Because if you make a mistake in this position, especially when you're not the one in power, uh, you can end up losing everything that you built up to that point, which almost happened to me. I got kicked off the team. And for many players, that would be the end of their careers. Luckily, I'm a different breed of individual. And in this book, I wrote about what happened after that. And I ended up playing pro basketball. But that's a different. I'll tell you more of that story on a different day. But if any of you read my favorite book and you all don't know what my favorite book is, my favorite book is The 48 Laws of Power by Robert Greene. Chapter number one. If you never read that book, go get it as soon as this is over. Chapter number one, The 48 Laws of Power. Never outshine the master. Now, he's using master as a metaphor. It doesn't mean like somebody's a master over you or you're a slave or nothing like that. It means whenever you're in a position that someone has more power than you, the dumbest thing you can do 
is pit yourself directly against that individual because they have more power than you. You have there's no way that you can win. That's just a stupid thing to do. It's just like any of you who has parents, if you've been raised with any amount of, of sense in home training, you know that you can't just go directly against your mother or your father when you're living under their roof because that's dumb. All right. They might they might uh, smack you in your face and knock you on the ground, depending on how you were raised. They might kick you out of the house or whatever they can do. They might ground you so that you can't do anything. You can't go out. You lose your phone. They take your car keys away. Whatever happens, you're probably not going to win that power struggle. When you're in a position that someone has more power than you, you have to be smart enough and intelligent enough to know, hey, I should probably fall back on this situation. I should probably just keep my mouth shut. I don't agree with them. I don't even like this person. But you know what? I want to keep my job. So let me shut up. Let me stop talking before I cost myself this job, before I cost myself this opportunity. Any of you who works at a job right now, if you got a boss, or there's somebody there who has more authority than you, it would not be smart of you to go head up against that person because they have more power than you. You know it. They know it. And everybody else who works there knows it. So if y'all go head to head and push comes to shove, who's going to fall? Of course, it's going to be you. So this is a lesson that you learn through. I learned this lesson through making a mistake. I should not have gone head up against that coach, even though he was not really knowing what he was doing. And even though for for posterity's sake, I actually proved myself correct. My career kept going. He got fired from coaching the next year after that. And he never coached again. So he wasn't a good coach. That posterity proved that he was terrible at coaching, and posterity proved that I was a pretty good basketball player. I was the only one on my on that team who ended up going pro and having a career. So I ended up being right. I was right, 100%. But being right cost me a year and a half of my career in college basketball. So did it matter that I was right? I mean, did I gain anything from being right? No, I didn't gain any. The only thing I gained from being right is be able to tell you right now that 15 years ago I was right about some power struggle that I lost. So what did I actually get? Nothing. Tangibly, I didn't gain anything from being right in that situation. So sometimes, again, any of you who has an ego, any of you who you know, tends to pop off at the mouth a little bit more than you should, and you know who you are if you're this type of individual, and you probably know somebody like this, even if it's not you, all right, you got to be wise and learn when to shut up. All right, there is a time in life to shut up. There is a time in life to speak up, but neither of them is all the time. All right. Don't shut up all the time and don't speak up all the time. This is wisdom, knowing when to use which pieces of information. So that's what I learned from that coach. When I got kicked off that team, that was a piece of wisdom that I gained going through that negative experience. Now, you need to learn from that and don't you make the same mistake because I already made it. All right. Hove did that. So hopefully you don't have to go through that. Point number nine. For those of you who came in the middle of this, I'm telling you the best advice I ever got from my basketball coaches all my years playing basketball. So now we are moving on to when I was in. Lithuania. Now, this is pro basketball. So 9, 10, 11, 12. These are all things I learned when I was playing pro basketball. So I told you about when I was a youth basketball, high school basketball, college. Now we're going into pros. This is my first ever job playing overseas. I was in Kaunas, Lithuania. And it was the first practice. Now, I just told you about my college experience, right? In college, I was like a wing type of player. That was my natural position in college, even at a D3. And the coach was trying to make me play power forward and center. Obviously, that wasn't working. I get kicked off the team. So my last year and a half of college basketball, all I'm doing is just practicing by myself. My last, my senior year, I was playing intramurals. We won the championship in intramurals, by the way. But I'm playing intramurals. And, excuse me, me and a couple of my teammates, before the season and after the season, we would just go around and play pickup against whoever. We was playing in every league. We was playing five-on-five five against the team up at the, the D1 campus, at Penn State main campus. We was just going around hooping with everybody. And y'all heard from... My man, Wes Pfeiffer. Y'all heard from him on my podcast. You've been listening to my show long enough. You heard when I was talking to Wes Pfeiffer. And if you got those overseas insider interviews, saw the interview with Wes. But anyway, that was a year and a half not playing. Then the first year after graduating college, I worked a couple regular jobs. I worked at Foot Locker for six months. Then I worked at Bally Total Fitness for six months. And while I was doing that, I was just going to LA Fitness and working out. I had a gym membership, $50 a month. LA wasn't even 50 it was like $30 a month up in, up in PA. LA Fitness, working on my game, uh, playing pickup against whoever, playing in a couple random leagues here and there, which I couldn't really play in because I had a job. And sometimes at Foot Locker, I worked at the mall. So you work at night. When I worked at Bally Total Fitness, sometimes I worked at night. So I couldn't even play in leagues. All I did was just work on my game and play pickup at LA Fitness for a whole year after graduating college. And I'm talking about I'm trying to play overseas. This, is what, this was my life. I was living in my parents' house, barely making enough money to you know, get my, break my mom off something because I'm an adult living in her house now. Enough money to pay my cell phone bill. I wasn't going on no dates or nothing like that because I didn't really have no bread like that. And I'm working at Foot Locker and Bally Total Fitness. 
talking about I'm going to play professional basketball. My future did not look like I was going anywhere. Uh, my future didn't look like, it didn't look like this. Uh, you see them palm trees on the roof back there? Uh, my future didn't look like this when I was working at Foot Locker, okay? Now, why am I telling you all this? I finally get a job. I go to an exposure camp, get my first job playing overseas in Lithuania. First practice, the coach says, all right, you are going to play point guard. Now, this is the first time in my life I had ever been told that I was going to be the point guard on a team. But it makes sense because I'm playing on a professional team. We got much taller guys on the team. I'm not one of the tallest guys on this team, finally, in this particular situation. So he's like, play point guard. And we're running the plays. He's like, all right, you're going to run. And the coach couldn't even speak English. My first coach could not speak English. So me and him never had a conversation. He would say something to the team manager, and the manager would say it to me. And the thing about the manager, he was more of a business guy than a basketball guy. So he didn't really understand basketball. So the coach would say something to him, and then he would try to explain him. He didn't even know what he was talking about because he didn't understand the language of basketball. So imagine this. American guy. I'm at my first job overseas. My first time out of the country. I'm in practice. The coach is trying to tell me to do something. None of my teammates could really speak English. None of my teammates spoke English except the American. It was me, one other American, and it was a dude from Africa. He spoke English. The American spoke English. I spoke English. The team manager spoke English, and nobody else spoke English. None of the players, none of the other coaches, nothing. And the manager who spoke English, he did not understand basketball. So he's trying to translate what the coach says, but he didn't know what it meant. So I finally get the understanding that the coach wants me to run a pick and roll. All right, that's what he was finally trying to say. I finally understood it, pick and roll. And one of my teammates, both of them, they had played overseas before, so they had experience. So they was telling me, Dre, you're going to run the pick and roll. So they run the pick and roll. The problem was I had never run a pick and roll as the ball handler before in my life up to that point. And I'm overseas. I got overseas because of my athleticism, my ability to play above the rim. I was like a scorer, like an all-around wing type player, like a two, three wing type guy. I was not, I never sold myself as a point guard, but I get there and they try to put me at the point guard position. We ended up figuring it out. But I'm telling you all that to tell you this. This is point number nine. When you are a professional at what you do and somebody's paying you for your skills and you get an opportunity based on uh, your ability to sell yourself or whatever it is that you did to get yourself out there, skills will be expected of you. And it's your job to know what skills are going to be expected of you because if you don't have the skills that they want you to have, you can end up out of an opportunity. Now, I went over there thinking, all right, I'm athletic. I can jump. You know, I can play above the rim. I'm going to just go over there and just dunk on people, and that's going to be my thing. I'm going to fill the wings. I'm going to play off the ball, get a cut, get a nice pass from the point guard, dunk on people, do my athletic thing, and I'm going to show them how great of a player I am. That's what I thought I was going to do. But then we get over there, and they're like, no, you're going to play point guard. And I'm, I, that, was, that never crossed my mind that they were going to put me at point guard. I did not have the point guard instincts to play that position, but I was able to figure it out because I had enough game to figure it out. We figured it out. But the whole point is this, what I want y'all to understand so y'all don't make the same mistake. When you get an opportunity, you need to find out before you get to that opportunity, what are the skills they're going to expect from me? What is it that people are going to want from me? What am I going to have to do that I might not be thinking about? Go talk to somebody who's already been down that road. Go talk to somebody who's already done what you had to do. Go talk to somebody who's made the mistakes that they want to make sure you don't make and find out what skills are going to be expected of you. Because the last thing you want to happen is to show up somewhere thinking that the program is this. And then the program is something completely different. And then when you can't do their program, they don't even want to hear about your program. And now your opportunity is over. Now you're outside wondering how the hell you ended up outside of the room when you was just inside the room five minutes ago. All right, so you want to make sure that does not happen to you. Because I've seen it happen to a lot of people who just weren't ready for the opportunity that was put in front of them, thinking it was one thing, but it became something different. Point number 10. Today's topic, for those who came in the middle of this, I'm giving you part two of two. The best advice that I ever got from coaches. And again, the coach didn't give me that advice. That's just something that I, I took away from the experience. So some of this is advice I was given directly. And many of these are just things that I extracted from the situation. Nobody actually told me these things, but I extracted them from the situation. I'm teaching you so that you don't have to go through these challenges that I went through. Point number 10. To whom much is given, much is expected. What this means is, I'll tell you two, two times. One time I was in Mexico playing. And the coach was saying to me, or it's not even the coach, this guy was like a manager. He had put me onto this team. He got me put on this team. And I'm playing with these guys. And he says to me, Dre, look, actually, it wasn't even the manager who said this. It was my dude, G. I got to back up in the story. So I met this dude, G, when I was playing for this traveling team in the States. I'll tell you about that in a minute. But G had experience playing in Mexico. He had been playing in Mexico for years. 
and he saw me play. We would play pickup like on our off days. And he saw me play. He was like, he would just pull me to the side on the low. He was like, yo, when I go back to Mexico, I can tell you can play. I can tell you can play like real basketball. I'm gonna put you on. When I get down there, I'm gonna holler at my man down here. He knows how to hook people up. He's Mexican. He's well connected in the Mexican leagues. I'm gonna tell him about you. I'm gonna call you when I get down back down to Mexico. Just you know, it just hit me back, and I'm gonna connect you with this dude. We're gonna get you on. And I'm like, all right, cool. So he goes back to Mexico. I'm still playing for this traveling team in the States. And I'm going to tell you about that traveling team in a moment. A month or so goes by. He finally calls me. He's like, yo, Dre, remember I told you I was going to put you on when I got down here? I'm like, yeah, what's up? And he was like, look, I'm going to connect you with my man. I'm going to give him your number. He's going to call you. And he's going to bring you down here and you know, just do your thing. Play. I'm like, all right, cool. And true to his word, my dude G, he hit me up. Matter of fact, he hit me on email. I hadn't talked to G in years. He hit me on email like two months ago. I got to holler at him again, as a matter of fact, that I'm talking about him. But dude hits me up, this Mexican guy who he had played Mexican basketball. He's an older guy. He was retired at that point. He was like an agent slash manager. He calls me. I go down to Mexico, playing ball in Mexico. The guy gets me on the team. My first game, I remember I hit up G because G is living in Mexico. This dude G is American. He's from the United States, but he lived in Mexico. He had like a couple kids. He had a Mexican wife and everything. He spoke fluent Spanish and everything. Straight up black dude from the hood, but he lives in Mexico with a Mexican wife and all these kids, and he spoke fluent Spanish. But anyway, I remember I was texting G, letting him know, like, yo, I'm about to play my first game tonight. I'm in this city, this city. Because Mexico is not as big as the United States, but it's still a pretty big country. So G was at a different place from where I was at. But when I had my first game, he ended up coming to the game because he was near me. And I remember before the game, he sent me a text. And he said, yo, shoot the ball every time and don't pass the ball to nobody. <laughs> That's what he said. <laughs> he said, shoot it every time and don't pass to anybody. And I didn't know why he said that, but I later on learned after the game, because I remember I was playing and I got an M1 layup and G was standing right along the baseline. He was just standing there smiling like, yeah, yeah, that's what you're supposed to be doing. But he told me, he was like, yo, down there, the only thing they expect is for you to put the ball in the basket. If you're an American playing down here, you're supposed to score. I don't care what your game is. You're trying to be, don't go out here trying to be Draymond Green. Don't go out here trying to be a defensive stopper. Go out, don't go out here trying to be a passer. Score points. That's the only thing they respect. That's the only thing they remember. If you score points, they're going to think you're a superstar. If you don't score, they're going to think you're garbage. Just score points. Shoot the ball every time. Just score as many points as you can. And he explained that to me, and I got to see how people was playing, and I saw other Americans playing. That's all they was doing. They was just shooting the ball every time. Of course, some of them were good. Some of them were not. But this is the game that you had to play. And if you didn't score, people thought you just weren't good. And I remember talking to the manager dude, the Mexican guy, and he was telling me, like, Dre, yo, I can see that you have game. When we play pickup and when we practice, you're doing your thing. But in the games, you don't be shooting enough. You don't be scoring enough. You got to score more points out here. That's all they respect out here is scoring points. Score points. And I got the message drilled in my head. Now, a couple of years later, I'm in Germany. I'm with a different agent. Trying to, get it, trying to get on the journey. I was with a team in Germany. Then that team couldn't pay me anymore. So I left that team. I'm hanging around Germany for like three weeks. I finally connect with an agent. I hustle my way to find a new agent. Agent says, come up to this town that I'm at. I own a hotel. I'll put you in a hotel. And you can just stay here at this hotel. I'm going to bring you around to some teams. And we're going to get you a deal. Boom. I go up there to see this agent. He brings me to a practice with a team. This is like the first time. Was the first time? No, probably not the first time. But one of the first times he ever saw me play. And we're practicing with this team. I think they was in the third division in Germany. And we're doing these drills. And he has us doing these one-on-one. The coach has us doing these one-on-one -on -one drills where you play offense five times, you play defense five times, and he matches you up with somebody. And the agent who brought me there, he's just sitting in the stands watching. So on the defensive drill, they matched me up with this German kid who was younger than me. He, like, he was maybe 19, 20 years old. At this time, I'm maybe 25, 26. But dude is a little bit taller than me, skinny. You could tell he was young. But he was like their young talent. They were grooming him to be good. So they matched me up with this kid. I got to guard him five straight times. He went 0 for 5. He did not score not one time. I shut him down. Then I get to play offense, and he got to guard me. I went 5 for 5. I scored all five times on this kid. He scored 0 or 5 times on me. I feel like I did my thing. Like they trying to match me up. Solomon was good. My dude, Solomon, in Germany. He was in Germany. But anyway, uh, he, I go 5 for 5 on dude. Dude goes 0 for 5 on me. Boom. I finish the practice, I go to, uh, go to dinner with the agent. And the agent and his, uh, 
his assistant, he had like an assistant agent who he was grooming to be an agent with him, right? To work with him. We sit down at dinner at the hotel in Germany after this practice and I'm feeling good. And I did an IG post about this. So y'all saw that post. I talk about it. And I'm sitting at dinner and they, we're about to talk about my game. The dude agent, he's about to tell me, hey, Dre, here's where I see you can go. Here's what I think you can do. Here's what I think about your game and all that. So I'm feeling good. I'm feeling high and mighty. Like I, I, I stopped this little German kid, scored on him. He can't do nothing with me. I'm like, yeah, he's about to tell me how my future is going to be so bright. And this is what he says. He says, Dre, we were uh, disappointed in your performance at the practice tonight. And I almost dropped my fork. I'm like, what? <laughs> what, the hell? what are you talking about? How are you disappointed in my practice? I scored every time I got the ball. Dude didn't score none of the times he got the ball. How are you disappointed? What did I do wrong? And the other and the assistant agent sitting there and they just looking at me. And then the agent says to me, Dre, yeah, you were scoring, but uh, you was working too hard to score your points. This is what he said. He said you were working too hard to score your points. You were using too much energy to score. You were dribbling too many times. It didn't look easy enough when you scored on this kid. Now, I didn't tell him this, but the real reason slash excuse for why it was so hard, because the floor was so damn dusty that I couldn't really get traction. So you can't, when you can't get traction on the floor, any of you who plays ball who's a guard, it's hard to cross over. It's hard to change direction because the floor is too dusty. You can't get any grip. That was the real reason why I was, I was kind of playing like an old man's game on a kid. I was like backing him down and doing spin moves and making post moves and stuff. I was still scoring, but it was harder because the floor was just not conducive to playing basketball. But any of you play overseas, you'll learn about that very soon. All right, Every floor is dusty as hell. All right, so anyway, and I'm looking at the dude and I'm like, really? I, I tried too hard to score. And I was trying to get him to explain it. And he said, look, over here, you're an American, Dre. Over here. You got to score. Not only do you got to score points, but you got to make it look so easy as if you weren't even trying. That's how you got to do it. You got to make it look like you weren't even trying. And if it looks like you're trying too hard, the coaches and the fans, they perceive that as being that you're just not that good. And that's why you got to try so hard to score your points. And I said, OK, I didn't argue with the guy because, mind you, I'm staying at his hotel. He's the one who's he's my only lifeline to getting a job in Germany at this point. So I didn't argue with the guy, even though I didn't agree with what he was saying. But I got his point. So the next game, he put me on this team that he was affiliated with and said, just playing this game. We just want to see what else you can do after that talking to. So you know what I did the next game? I took my dude G's advice from back in Mexico. <laughs> I just shot the ball every time. <laughs> I scored about 40 points in this game. I got me a nice little highlight video out of it because I just, I just shot the ball every time. I literally shot the ball every time. I scored a whole bunch of points. We won the game. I got a couple of highlights. I tried to do the T-Mac, throw the ball off the backboard thing, but I threw it too high and I missed it. But that was when the game was already over. The game was already decided when I did that. But, and we ended up winning the game. And it was a big game for that team. So I ended up you know, creating an opportunity for myself there. I'm telling you all that to tell you this. When you are at that level, at the professional level of what you do, people expect you not only to do your job, but to make it look easy and to make everybody else's job easy just because. Just because they're paying you, just because you're the superstar, just because you're the number one draft pick, just because you're getting paid more money, just because you're the American and you're in Europe, for whatever the reason, people are going to expect you to make the job look easier than everybody else makes it. And you got to make everybody else's job easier at the same time. And you got to make sure the team is successful. You got to do all of those. Not one out of them, not one, not two, all three. You got to do all of that. And if you fail on any one of them, they're going to think there's something wrong with you. Something is defective about your game and you're going to get replaced by somebody else. That's the way the game goes. And any of you who's played uh, ball overseas, you know what I'm talking about. And any of you who is about to play ball overseas, you will learn what I'm talking about. But listen, take my word for it and don't learn the hard way because they might not be as nice. See, that agent was nice and he told me that and gave me another shot to see what else I would do after that talking to. But some teams are going to be like, yo, this dude ain't good. And they would just fire you. And you back on a plane, going back to the United States, wondering what just happened. And they won't even explain it to you. They won't even tell you what that dude told me. He didn't even have to tell me that, but he told me. And a lot of times people lose their jobs, don't even know why they lost their job. And it's because of this, what I'm telling you now. So make sure you know this before you get that opportunity or anything that you do in life. Now, number 11. All right, so we've got two more. Now, this, for those of y'all came in the middle of this, I'm telling you the best advice I ever got from my basketball coaches. This is part two of two. It's part seven through 12. Number 11, I was playing in Montenegro. This was, was it the same year? No, about a year after the Germany situation. I'm in Montenegro, and I remember signing with this team, Montenegro, and I was excited about this. I made this opportunity happen damn near from zero. 
I wrote about it in this book right here. I'll tell you about this in a minute. And this team had a brand new facility. So he put me up in this apartment. The apartment was straight. Everything was good. The internet cafe was right downstairs. I don't know how it is in Europe now with Wi-Fi, but back then you had to go to the internet cafe and plug your computer into the ethernet cord to get the internet. It wasn't no Wi-Fi in the apartments and stuff, at least not in the apartment I was in. But anyway, it was all, the whole situation was straight. I liked the situation. They had a brand new gym. So this was all great. I mean, there's nothing more you can ask for. Brand new gym, nice apartment, internet cafe right downstairs. Get to use it for free because the dude, the manager of the team was married to the person who owned the internet cafe. So I used it for free. Perfect. The facility that we practiced in, this is in the middle of the winter. It's like January. Facility that we practiced in had no heat. <laughs> no heat in the gym. Now, mind you, it's not like this a movie theater where you could just put on coats and hats and sit like this and stay warm. We're playing basketball with shorts and T-shirts on. There's no heat in the gym. So I remember we would come in the gym. The coach, I swear to God, the whole time I was on this team, I never saw that coach without his coat on. This dude had this big, long coat. It's like, like a bubble coat, but it was his long coat that went all the way down to, to his calf muscles. He always had on a coat all the time because it was so damn cold in the gym. The assistant coaches always had on coats. It was one assistant who would wear a sweater. Everybody else had on coats. All of us, we on the court playing basketball, dribbling with T-shirts on and tank tops. And the gym didn't have a water fountain. There's no water fountain in the gym. So this is how they would do it. Every player would bring like a one liter, like a, a bottle of water like this. Not a glass one, but a plastic bottle. A lot of the players, not all of them, but a few of the players would bring these big water bottles. And then when the coach gave us like a little break, like take, get some water, get a water break. All the players would go around and gather around like four or five bottles. And then we would take turns drinking out of the bottle. I never drank out of those bottles. Now, I'm going to tell you one thing that was great about Montenegro. Two things that were great. It was a lot of things great, but two specific things. One. My outside shot was the best it's ever been when I was in Montenegro simply because we practiced twice a day, every day, five days a week. We had one game a week on Saturday. So we practiced so much. And all they brought me in for was just to be an outside shooter. That's all they wanted me to do was just shoot jump shots. I remember I had a wide open jump shot one time and I took my time to get ready for it. Somebody ran at me. I went around that dude, drove to the hole, made a layup. And the coach was like, no, don't do that. Shoot the three. <laughs> he didn't, they didn't want me to do anything. That didn't involve shooting jump shots because they just wanted me to be, they wanted me to be Reggie Miller, Ray Allen on that team, which is fine by me, as long as, the check, as, long as they was cutting the check. And the other thing is, the other thing that was great about Montenegro, my conditioning was great because I never, ever drank from those bottles of water. Because mind you, you, there's a bunch of sweaty basketball players, they putting their sweaty hands on the bottle. Now, you got to touch the bottle. And you know, when people are sharing from a bottle, sometimes it touches their mouth a little bit. And I'm like, yo, I'm not touching that bottle. I'm not drinking nothing out of those bottles. It was just too nasty. It made my, it just, I was like, no, I'm not touching that bottle. I ain't drinking nothing. I decided like the first week of practice, I said, I'm going to go through these practices without drinking any water. And one thing that was good, it wasn't hot in there. It was cold because it was no, eight, it was no heat. So it's not like I was losing a ton of sweat. You barely even sweat. You go through a whole two-hour practice not even sweating because it's so damn cold in the gym. We got hoodies on. Dude's got long sleeve shirts on. And we're supposed to be practicing basketball. Now, I'm telling you that to tell you this. One day we're in practice and the coach has us doing like the shell drill. Those of y'all know what the shell drill is. It's like a defensive drill where the offensive group has the ball and they pass the ball around. And you on defense, you got to move in accordance to where the ball is. So you got to be in help position. Then you got to be one pass away, deny the ball. Then you got to get up on the ball. Then you got to be help side. You got to tell your man where the ball is at. You got to cover the backside, this and that. It's a shell drill. It's basically a drill where you're moving around on defense just to get your team ready to play defense. And you're supposed to do it fast because you're working on your defense, right? You got to be reactive when you're playing defense. But it's so damn cold in the gym. Now, one thing about Montenegro, it is right on the Bay of Couture in uh, Europe. So it's not like it was, it wasn't zero below or no such thing as zero below. No, it wasn't 10 degrees below. It was like 40, 50 degrees every day. So it's not super duper cold, but that's still pretty cold. If it's 50 degrees outside, you're not playing basketball outside, are you? So that's how it was in the gym, 50 degrees. So we're doing this defensive drill, and we never did defensive drills. This is the one day we're doing the defensive drill. I don't know why. Maybe the coach was bored. He had run out of drills to do. And I was kind of going 75% in the drill. I admit it. I was not going 100% in this drill simply because it was so damn cold. I didn't want to pull a muscle. I didn't want to pull a groin muscle. Just like I told you, in Europe, the floors are always dusty, so it was hard to get traction. So I didn't want to slip 
and turn an ankle or pull a muscle trying to do a defensive drill for no reason because his coach didn't really care about defense. He didn't get mad at anybody for messing up on defense. He get mad you messed up on offense. So he got doing this, and I'm going halfway in the drill, and he says to one of my teammates, because mind you, again, this coach did not speak English. So he says to one of my teammates who was, uh, I believe he was Serbian, but he had played in Germany, so he spoke perfect English. He says to my teammate, hey, tell Dre, and my coach tell, and the dude tells me, hey, the coach said um, you need to play a little bit harder in this drill. You're moving too slow. And I was like, yeah, I'm, no, I'm, I'm trying to move, but he's like, yo, you're not moving fast enough in the drill. And I said, this is what I said out loud in English. I said, it's cold as a M effort in this gym. And I said that in English. Now, most of my teammates did not speak English. But when I said that, all of them knew exactly what I said. Because one thing y'all don't know, any of y'all who's American, or Europeans know all the American curse words. Or they know all of them. So when I said that, they knew exactly what I said. So everybody started laughing. <laughs> all the players started laughing. <laughs> even though they didn't speak English. And the coach even laughed a little bit. And then he said to my teammate who translated for me, he said, yeah, I understand, Dre, but, you know, everybody else is playing hard. They're cold, too. You got to go hard just as well. And the point that I want you to get out of this is that when you got a job to do, you got to do it anyway. Even when you don't feel like it, even when it's inconvenient, even when the circumstances make no sense and it shouldn't be like that. How you playing professional basketball? You got a brand, how you got a brand new gym that doesn't have any heat? Makes no sense. In the middle of winter, they had no heat. I don't know. I can't even explain that. Somebody asked, are American floors dusty? Not as dusty as in Europe. Uh, European floors were way more dusty than American floors, in my experience. So you still got to do your job anyway. That's the point. Especially when you're a pro, sometimes the circumstances will not be what you want, and you're going to have to figure it out. And if you don't want to deliver, despite the circumstances, they will replace you with somebody who will deliver, despite the circumstances. That's just what the job is. Last one, number 12. I got to get through this quick so we can get to the questions. I'm answering questions after this one. I'm telling you all the best advice, the best stories, the best information that I got that I gleaned from my basketball coaches. Number 12, I was playing on this team. This was earlier in my career. Go back in the story. I'm playing for this team called the Harlem Ambassadors. This is my second year after starting my career. So I started my career in Lithuania. The next place I was at was this team called the Harlem Ambassadors. Now, Harlem Ambassadors is like a show basketball team. It wasn't like quote unquote real basketball because we would play we had our team all American people and we would go play like exhibition type games against random people in these random towns all over America so when I tell you that I've been to like every state in the United States it's not because I just like traveling I like traveling but not like that I'm in every state in the United States because I played for the Harlem Ambassadors we played games in we was in Colorado Wyoming North Dakota Kansas Tennessee, I don't know if some of y'all are from these places, but I'm from, I'm an East Coast guy. So we in Wyoming, uh, what other, I can't even remember the names of the states. Wyoming, North Dakota, South Dakota, New Mexico. We in these places that I would never have gone had it not been for the Harlem Ambassadors, right? So, we, and we driving around a 15 passenger van. Now, Harlem Ambassadors are out of business now. If any of y'all looking to try to play for them, they don't exist. And if y'all don't know what the Harlem, all right, there we go. Y'all know what the Harlem Ambassadors is. Y'all know the Harlem Globetrotters? Everybody heard of the Harlem Globetrotters? All right. The Harlem Ambassadors is like the Costco version of the Harlem Globetrotters. All right, so you take the Harlem Globetrotters, put them in Walmart, and you got the Harlem Ambassadors. That was us. So I'm playing for this team, and I remember early in the season, because they gave us our contracts, and they gave us this documentation that tells us how things go. And it was explaining how we get paid. And the way that we got paid was, it was like peculiar setup. It's not like we give you this much, and you just get paid the same amount every two weeks. That's not how they did it. They paid you on that team. They paid you by the game. So every game you played in, you got a certain game check. And then every day that the team was on the road, you got paid for being on the road with the team. And then you got a per diem, which is like money that they give you each day just so you can take care of your like getting food. And if you want to go to the snack shop or something like that. So that's the way they paid us. So it was kind of hard to figure out how you got paid because we didn't play games every day. Sometimes we play two games a week, sometimes three, sometimes only one. And then they would give you per diem. So you had to kind of calculate how much money you was making. And then this is what also what they did. They took like a little bit out of your paycheck for like withholding. So they would hold like 20% of your check. And you didn't get that part till the end of the season. They, they would hold it back. And the reason they did this is because players will always leave the team in the middle of the season because I guess they didn't like it. They would leave. So if anybody left during the season, that 20% that they were holding, you never got that money. They basically kept your money. I didn't like that way that contract was situated. But let's get to that. I would call at the beginning of the year when we first started traveling, we're on the road. Because mind you, Harlem Ambassadors had no home games. Every game we played was in somebody else's gym. 
And even though I said states that many of you, I mean, there are a lot of people in like Tennessee, Texas, Florida, New York, we weren't playing in like Dallas or San Antonio or Houston. We were playing in these small towns that never see big time sports, like these little towns that you couldn't find on a map unless you heard of it before. That's the kind of places that we were playing in, these little small places where a team like us was a big deal. Like, it's not like we could play in Houston because Houston would be like, yo, why do we need to watch y'all and we could watch the Houston Rockets? <laughs> right? So it wasn't like we were playing anywhere near there. We played in these small places and these crazy towns. I've seen some things, boy, I tell you. I, that's a separate conversation. Again, some of that I can't even tell you. But anyway, I will call the home office of the Harlem Ambassadors while we're on the road asking them questions about the contract because I didn't quite understand how the contracts were set. I didn't quite understand how I was getting paid. Sometimes it'd be a certain amount of money I thought I was getting, and I would get less than that. And I'm like, this doesn't make sense. Not adding up what I'm getting. So I would call the main office, and I would ask them, like, yo, I got some questions about my contract. And they would always put me on the phone with the main dude, the owner of the organization, this dude named Dale. They would put me on the phone with him. And Dale would come to the phone the first time I called, and he explained to me how the contract was working. He was like, well, you see, Dre, you got to understand. We do this and we hold this and we do that. And he explained it to me the first time. I said, all right, cool. Thanks for explaining it, Dale. Boom, hang out with him. I keep playing. Then the next paycheck came in. And again, I didn't quite understand it. Even though he told me the first time, I didn't understand what happened the second time. I called him again. We talked about it. it. Happened again. Next time that I called them, I remember I called the main office. He wasn't the one answering the phone because he had a staff. So his assistant answers the phone and I say, yo, it's Dre. I want to ask some questions about the contract, whatever. So he's like, all right, let me put Dale on the phone. Dale comes to the phone. And before he even said anything, this is what he said. He said, Dre, the only time I hear about, the only time I hear from you is when it's about your money. <laughs> and he was kind of being tongue in cheek, but at the same time, he was being serious. And he was right. Because the only time I ever called him was to find out about that bag. Because that was the reason I was playing there. Well, I wanted him to play basketball. The other one was to get that bag. And the bag wasn't making sense. So I needed some clarification on the bag. Y'all know what I mean when I say the bag, right? So why am I telling you this? And he wasn't even a coach. So I kind of cheated on this one. But here's the thing you need to understand about that story and why I'm telling you. The only person who really gives a damn about you and your career is you. Your agent is not responsible for your career. Your wife is not responsible. Your kids are not responsible. Your man is not responsible. Your teammates, your coworkers, your secretary, your accountant, they are not responsible for your career. They're not responsible for you getting your money. They're not responsible for your business being in order. You are 100% responsible. So if you mess it up, it's your fault. If you're not on top of your business and your business is not right, it's your fault. If you're expecting to get the bag and you only get half of the bag and you don't know what happened to the other half, it's your fault. Because even if you have people who work for you, even if you got people double checking, even if you have people who are supposed to be organizing that for you and they messed up, it's your fault for not double checking their work before they messed up. You got to take full ownership of all that. That's what it means to be a professional. Everybody understand that. Now, what I'm going to do now, I gave you all 12. I'm going to recap these last six that I gave you. Then I'm going to tell you about these books that I got in front of me. Then I'm going to answer any questions that we got. But I know I'm going to run out of time here on this live. So if I, when I get that two minute warning on Instagram, I might have to stop it and restart it. But I'll come right back in. But anyway, let's get to these and see how much time we got. The last six points, best advice I ever got from basketball coaches. Number seven, coach said, I didn't bring you to be here, here to be an average player. You got to show your game fully and boldly, whatever it is, you got to show it 100%. Point number eight, listen to the boss. Never outshine the master. You got to be, you got to know, you got to be smart enough to know when to speak up and when to shut up. Sometimes it makes sense to not say anything, even though you may know that you're right. Number nine, skills will be expected of you. When I went to Lithuania, they had me playing pick and roll. I didn't know how to play pick and roll, but you got to know what the expectations are of you before you get there. Don't show up not knowing what's going on and then be surprised when the, the program is different from what you thought the program was. Number 10, to whom much is given, much is expected. When I was playing in Mexico and in Germany, I had the same thing happen both times. The person, somebody in charge said to me, yo, they expect you to score points out here. You can't be doing that all around. Draymond Green, defensive stopper, passing the ball thing. You got to put the ball in the basket because that's the only thing they respect. If you're not putting the ball in the basket, they don't respect it. You're not going to think you're good and you're not going to get a job and you're not going to keep a job. Number 10. No, number 11. I was playing in Montenegro. The gym is cold as ever, cold as hell. I wasn't moving fast enough in the defensive drill. I told the coach that. Everybody laughed because I cussed. Everybody heard, knew what that word was. The coach said, listen, everybody else is cold too, but they still doing their job. You got to do yours. And I was the only American on the team. You can't not do your job when you're the only American on the team because everybody's watching you. Everybody sees you. You come up short, you will be outside out of a job. And number 12, 
I was playing for this team and the money wasn't right. The bag wasn't right. The checks weren't making sense. I kept calling the dude to figure out what was going on. He said, Dre, the only time you call me is when it's about your money. And he was damn right about that. That's the only time I called him because the only thing I cared about as far as he was concerned. You need to be the same way with your money. If you're not on top of your money, nobody else is on top of it. If you're not checking on your bag, nobody else is checking on the bag. If you mess up or somebody on your team messes up and it's your team, you messed up. All right, somebody on your team messes up under your name then you're the one who messed up because you weren't on top of the business. That is the job, and that's the way that it works. Now, I just told you the 12 best things between yesterday and today, the best advice that I ever got from my basketball uh, coaches, agents, owners, managers, agents, whoever they were in basketball. Now, I'm going to take any questions that anybody has. Go ahead and post it in the comments section. Actually, let me get to these questions, and then I'm going to tell you about these books that I got here in front of me. Actually, let me tell you about these books first. Both of these books are already paid for. Both of these books, all you got to do is take care of the shipping to get these books. They're already paid for. They are free. I'm going to tell you what they are, why you want them, and how to get them. This book right here, it's called The Mirror Motivation. It is the self-guide to self-discipline. That's the subtitle. I wrote this book for anyone who wants to really activate and tap into who you truly are as a person so you can start being who you really need to be and do what you truly need to do in your life so you can live the life that you really want to live, which means you're going to separate yourself from 99% of people out there who are drifting with no aims, no goals, no purpose, not knowing where they are or who they are or where they're going. You don't want to be one of those people. You don't want life kicking your behind every day. Get this book by going to mirrorofmotivation.com. So you can light yourself up from the inside out. It is not for me to motivate you. It's me to show you how to find the inspiration, the motivation within yourself. That's why it's called the mirror of motivation. Right, it's not the window of motivation where you look outside. It's the mirror of motivation where you look at yourself. Get this at mirrorofmotivation.com. This book right here is called The Overseas Basketball Blueprint. I just told you about playing overseas. This book right here is how I did it. I came from a D3 school, walked on. I told you how I wasn't even on the team my last year and a half on the team, last year and a half at school, worked regular jobs, went to an exposure camp, got my first deal, got my first agent, got my first deal, made a career out of it. This is the book that shows you the hustle that I did to get there. And I took out all the parts that messed up, everything that didn't work, all the trial and error. All I'm telling you in this book is the good stuff, the stuff that works, the stuff that you need to know and the stuff you need to do to start a professional basketball career ASAP. Go to balloverseas.com if you want to play professional basketball, travel the world, get paid to play a sport for two to three hours a day, get your food paid for, your housing paid for, your travel paid for. All you got to do is play basketball. If there's a better job in the world than this, somebody tell me what it is. I'm an entrepreneur, and being an entrepreneur is not a better job than being a professional basketball player. That's a true fact story. It's not even a story. It's just a fact. Balloverseas.com. You want to play professional basketball overseas. Balloverseas.com. Now I'm going to take questions. Hopefully I can get to these questions before we run out of time here on the live. If you got a question, go ahead and post it in the comments section. I'll get to it. Killian from Romania. What's good? Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Harris from CT. What's going on? Christy Dawn. What up? JMO said 100% learn that the hard way. I don't know which point you're referring to, but you're right. Whatever it is, you're right. <laughs> Harris Biz, appreciate that. Love from Chicago. All right, I got two minutes left, so I might have to stop this and start it back on. Brandon Joseph heard that story. I was talking about scoring points. I talked about that on, the, uh, on my IG post. I was working too hard to score points. Yes, that's exactly what he said. Those are the exact words that he said out of his mouth. D-Ching 52, what's good? All right, so I got a minute left. So what I'm going to do on IG, I'm going to stop this live, and I'm going to come right back in. So if you posted a question I didn't get to it, please repost it. And I will take questions. Shadow track runner, what's going on? I live in Maine, and I had to play in 40-degree weather outside. Yeah, no pro team's going to make you do that. Money Mesa, do you think you could put more Dre stories, vids, like you did here before? Only when I got a good story that's worth telling. It depends on what that story is. I got a lot of stories that will never get told on the Internet. Eyeball said, how did you get the chance to play for a Harlem team? Uh, my agent found that job. My agent got me that gig. And what division did you play in Lithuania and Germany? I was the first division in Lithuania and Germany. That was third or fourth? Third or fourth division. Kilior says, I also play and saw some things through my career. I agree with you. Appreciate that. What I do now to earn money, I'm an entrepreneur. I own my own business. I've been an entrepreneur for 10 years. I was an entrepreneur when I was still playing ball. Uh, Kilior, who's asking that question. 
Appreciate your stories. Thanks for the lesson and the knowledge. Wesley checking in from Florida. All right, those are all the questions. So listen, we're going to wrap this up here. We only got 30 seconds left. I used the whole hour to tell those stories. So tomorrow I'll take more questions. We got 30 seconds left. I'm going to tell you about these books again. Mirrorofmotivation.com. Self-guide and self-discipline. Light yourself up. Set yourself on fire. Be the person you truly want to be. Do what you really want to do. Live how you really want to live. Balloverseas.com, the overseas basketball blueprint. You want to play professional basketball overseas, get paid to play basketball, work out two hours, two to three hours a day is your whole work schedule. All you got to do is play basketball, but you got to be good. If you're not good at basketball, don't try to do this. Only if you want to play basketball. Balloverseas.com. I'm doing a live again tomorrow, 5 to 10 p.m. Eastern. Turn your notifications on. We